And welcome in once again to the latest edition of Be Conscious. I am Damian Barling. Can't thank you enough for joining me today. Really excited. We're going to get to Joma Alua. She's the author of So You Want to Talk About Race in Just a Heartbeat. We're going to jump right into things with her. I finished her book this weekend. Uh, really excited to have a conversation with her. I want to thank everybody who tuned in last week. I know it was a, a, a bit of a break from the norm, as uh, the Fresh Prince would say in summertime, but I had a couple of ideas. I really wanted to focus on Trayvon Martin and the birth of Black Lives Matter last week because uh, earlier this week, the Rest in Power documentary series about Trayvon Martin uh, premiered on BET. And earlier this month, it's the it's the five year anniversary of the George Zimmerman verdict, which ultimately launched Black Lives Matter. And it was really important to me to try to fit that conversation uh, into the month of July before this Trayvon Martin series ended. And I was hoping to have guests. And, you know, when I I reach for the stars when it comes to this podcast and I reached out to all three founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, wasn't able to to get any of them. I reached out to a few other people. I knew I had already talked to to Wesley Lowry, who was a big part of, of what happened in Ferguson. And I'm thinking I might reach out to him next year once we hit the five year anniversary of that. But it was it was really important that uh, I spend a few minutes talking about Trayvon Martin. So I know it was a little bit different to not have a guest, but I really hope uh, for those of you that listened uh, that you did enjoy it. And if you haven't checked out that episode, head back in the archives. As I mentioned, there's some great episodes that we've had in the young history of this show, including Wesley Lowry, as I just said, uh, Howard Bryant, which seems to be a, a topical podcast that just won't go away given the given the conversation in the NFL that, that just never ends Uh, the conversation about the national anthem and Jerry Jones. And now deck Prescott has involved himself. Uh, So that was our very first episode. That's there. Karan J Phillips. Uh, It's just some really, really good stuff uh, in the archives of the be conscious podcast. If you're not a subscriber yet, please hit subscribe. If you think the show was worth it, hit the five star review. If you have any questions about what we do comments on any episode, uh, feel free to reach out D Barling at sack local media. Dot com, or you can reach out across all social media platforms. Uh, Damien Barling. That's just my name. That's all you got to search, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. You'll be able to find me. Really happy to bring in the author of So You Want to Talk About Race, Ajoma Alua. Ajoma, how are you? Oh, good. Trying to balance, you know, summer with kids, breakfast and calls and all that. Well, I, I finished your book, so you want to talk about race this weekend, and I feel like I know all about your kids. I feel like I know about your whole family after finishing your book. <laughs> yeah, my kids are. Uh, it's it's funny for them, cause the the people who know them and walk up to them when they're you know running around and being kids. And what's great is you talked about an awkward conversation that you had with your mom about race right near the beginning of the book. I think you called it the most mortifying conversation you've ever had. And I thought, man, I've had that same conversation. <laughs> I think that's one of the great really? things. I think that's one of the great things about the book. Like, because as you talk and you lay everything out, it's like, I've been through all of this before. Yeah. You know, I was really surprised how much that story resonated with people. Um, just, you know, people who've either had that conversation or wish they could have had that conversation. And maybe it went much worse than that. And uh, it's been, you know, I, I included a lot of my. I included personal stories in that book for a couple of reasons. One, because I know that for people who haven't lived it, sometimes you actually need that empathy trigger in order to get to the practical work. But also I wanted people of color to see their stories, you know, and see bits of what they've lived in this book and understand that, you know, this is coming from a place similar to where they've been. Conversations about race and Jomar are so weird because usually because conversations sometimes evolve into debates or arguments and when it comes to debate or an argument, you want to win. And there's no it doesn't feel like there's any way to win a conversation that revolves around race. And you shouldn't try to, in all honesty. I mean, because we're talking about people's lived experience. We're talking about real hurt and pain and terror and violence. And that's not something where you come in and go, I want to win this talk about someone else's pain. And we have to look at it that way. I think that, you know, part of 
sometimes you can come to that conversation thinking it's something to win because you have the privilege to be emotionally distanced from it. But, you know, if someone was to come and tell you about their battle with cancer or, you know, about something else traumatic that's happened to them, you wouldn't say, I'm going to win this discussion about your cancer. Um, And yet, for some reason, when it comes to race, we immediately think that this is something where the best argument can win when we're actually talking about the lives of people. So why is it so personal with people when they talk about race? Is it is it guilt? Is it history? Is it denial? I think it's a mix of of multiple things. Part of it I, I want people to understand is by design. So we have been kind of programmed to only see discussions on race and racism as discussions about people with evil intent and people with good intent. And we see racists as Klan members, you know, and and neo-Nazis. We don't actually see it as a system that's brutalizing people and a system that people with the best of intentions may be helping to uphold and strengthen. And that's done, I personally believe, so that we don't actually take apart the system that benefits those at the top. And we don't think it's something we can do something about. We keep thinking that the answer to solving racism is just to get virulent, violent racists to love people of color. And that's not it. And so because all of the imagery we've ever seen around racism is extremely hate-filled, extremely physically violent, um, when we try to talk about the everyday ways in which people in America are perpetrating racism, of course you're going to get defensive. <laughs> if every image you've seen is, is a neo-Nazi and a Klan member, you know, you're going to think, "What? I'm not one of those. How dare you? And then, of course, you have people of color whose entire life has been has revolved around this trauma, this repeated trauma, this, these repeated small acts and, of violence and large acts of violence that shape the way we walk through the world. So you have one half of the conversation that is, of course, living this current pain and trying to find a way to communicate while still being harmed. And the other half of the conversation that feels like if they give an inch in this conversation, they're going to be put on the same level as clan members and their entire ego and identity as good people are threatened. And so you really have two very difficult positions. Now, one is based on reality and one is based on myth. And it, part of you know having to have effective conversations is learning about these defensiveness and learning how to kind of cut it off as it starts to arise and move past that to real productive conversation. You know, it, as you were talking about that, it brought to mind, you know, there's this trend right now, a gentleman, Major League Baseball, where they're discovering old tweets from baseball players. And it started during the All-Star game. And now, like, I think it's happened to two or three other players. But the one that happened at the All-Star game is the guy who was uh, uh, Josh Hader, a pitcher for the Houston Astros, tweeted, you know, seven years ago, white power. Uh, he tweeted uh, the N word. He he tweeted things like that. And I thought back to the first thing that the media did because they couldn't run to a white teammate and ask him questions about Josh Hader's character. They ha- had to find his black teammate and run to him and ask him to validate this guy who had tweeted this stuff seven years ago as a person. And just as you were talking, that brought back to mind how they had to run to his black teammate to kind of validate this person. And he had to kind of put his arm around him and say, no, it's, it's okay. He's changed. He, he's not racist anymore. And I just, I still find that fact astonishing. It is. It's, it's really interesting. The, it's already hard enough for people of color to have discussions on race and racism because you're talking about something that's harming you. Um, but then the additional burden when you're expected to actually make white people feel better about how complicit they've been or the part they've played in this um, adds an incredibly unfair extra burden to this conversation. And it happens all the time. And even when I go and I talk about my book, especially if I go to corporate situations and they want me to talk about my book and talk about having conversations on race, I always have to leave with the, you know, strong advice to not, go find the nearest person of color in your office and corner them and make them feel, make, have them make you feel better about this conversation (laughs) because it's not fair. And you can see the look of fear, um, especially in majority white offices of the few people of color as I'm talking, knowing, Oh, Oh, you're putting me in it. Now I'm going to have every, you know, fragile white person coming in and going, it's not that bad, is it? You know, I haven't done this. Have I? And, and then you're stuck, you know, dealing with, 
they're bringing up things that have happened where you have been harmed and you're stuck with the burden of trying to make them feel better about that. Um, it's, it's all part of white supremacy. And it's, and I wish we would see that th- these expectations on how these conversations should go are based in white supremacy. The idea that white people would need to be comfortable in a conversation when we're talking about the pain that they've helped cause people of color is white supremacy. The idea that, you know, it's all about what they can get out of the conversation, what they can learn, how they can feel better. It's all white supremacy. And we can't move forward if we're, you know, integrating white supremacy into the ways we even talk about dismantling it. And so I think we don't realize how much of these expectations as to who carries the burden, who has the most pain, whose job it is to move these conversations forward. They're all rooted in white supremacy. And I think a lot of this is it puts people in touch with feelings that they don't want to acknowledge that they've ever had. It's like, I think you had a line in your book, um, and and sorry if I'm paraphrasing, but it's we don't hate racism. We just prefer racism be more subtle. So you, yes. so some don't want to acknowledge that they've laughed at a racist joke or they've gotten cut off by a driver that was a person of color and maybe they thought something or said something out loud when they were, you know, in their moments of being alone. And I think that's part of what makes the conversation about race so difficult is a lot of people that you're having these conversations with, they want to say they're not racist, but yeah. they know in their heart that they, they have those feelings. Oh, definitely. And, you know, it would be impossible to come up in this in this system, in our society that is incredibly racist and not have some of that. You know, we we are sponges and from birth we're being told all of these different stories about people of color and all of these different stories about the relationship of white people to people of color. We have systems that are set to benefit white people at the expense of people of color and you grow up thinking that's completely normal. And I think one of the great fears is, is that people want to be proud of who they are. You know, they want to be proud of their accomplishments. They want to see themselves as good people. But the accounting that comes with challenging white supremacy means that you're going to find a huge amount of pain you've caused that doesn't really jive with who you want to see yourself as and who you want other people to see you as. It's very hard, especially in a society like America, where we like to tell everyone that they're self-made, right? We like to tell everyone that you created yourself out of the ether and you pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps and you are responsible for who you are. But in a system of white supremacy, that says a lot about who you are when you realize that you've been participating in systems of racism. And so it's really threatening. And especially if you've never had to look at it, that's one of the things where, you know, I think people of color, we grow up always having to observe very closely the ways in which white people act and think and talk because our survival depends upon it. But one of the interesting things about whiteness is that to, in order to make white supremacy something palatable to people who normally would not want to harm others, you have to make it invisible. And so for white people, it, it's actually imperative that you never see the way whiteness functions, that you never see the way that you are a part of an oppressive system, because you wouldn't want to be a part of it. And so you can get to age 50, 60, 70, your whole life, never looking at it. And that's the one part where it always, I don't know what it feels like to be 40 and realize that everything you thought about your identity is different than, than it is. You know, that you've been a part of an oppressive system, that all of these things you've been told about how you're a good person if you think good thoughts, you know, you're a good person if you're not actively calling someone the N-word, that none of that's true, that you've actually been harming people. I don't know what that would feel like in context of race. Of course, I have other areas of privilege where that confronts me, but I don't know if we have a system as pervasive and as deliberately invisible as our systems of race are. And I think that people, that's a huge identity crisis right there. You know, that's a huge identity crisis to say, no, actually, everything you've been told about being an individual actor is wrong. You've actually been influenced and been part of a system you weren't aware of, and you have blood on your hands. Um, That's going to be really hard, you know, as someone who's tried to live your life, be kind to others, to recognize and to feel accountable for and to try to make amends for 
And you mentioned uh, people not wanting to know how whiteness functions. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming what you mean by that is that the system, the life, the system of life that we live each day is built for and catered towards white people. Yes, most definitely. That's, that's We live in a white supremacist society that builds white as default. And you'll find it once you once you become aware, of course, you see it every day. Uh, the other day, actually, it was funny. Someone had said something. Someone had commented on a tweet I was saying and said, we were talking about hip hop artists. And it, this white man said, I think that we should never call a rapper a genius. That's not what genius is. And... I said, you know, I think you need to divorce your definition of genius from white supremacy. And he was completely, you know, and started, of course, listing all of his credentials of, you know, marching with King and whatnot, right? Um, But he never (laughs) stopped to think about what does genius mean? He kept saying, genius has a definition. And I'm like, well, what is that definition? Because you have to understand where that definition came from. And it doesn't actually. Genius doesn't really have a definition. No, we don't say this is a category that's genius and this isn't. We, we recognize that people who you know, show superior talent at certain things. So why not hip-hop? Why not rap? That's white supremacy saying, why not? And to recognize that those basic things where we would scoff and still think that we're anti-racist, but we would, of course, no, you know, Beethoven could be a genius. But could, you know, Hendrick? No. Right? And those are the things where we don't even recognize that. In those everyday instances, the world has been built to show whiteness as default. Whiteness is normal and preferred and ideal. And you don't even have to question it. You don't have to question where your definition of genius came from. I'm just envisioning someone typing back to you. I marched with Dr. Martin Luther King as their... uh, uh, credentials and as someone who follows you on Twitter you've got some gems like you have some interesting people that respond to you I do um, it's you know it's interesting I think I've narrowed it down quite a bit on Twitter luckily just I block with wild abandon um, I actually I also love to mute people I love the idea of someone just wasting their time yelling at me and they're muted and I can't hear it um, that's my own little personal petty feeling but you know people respond and they want to they want they are feeling harmed by the truth (laughs) and they want you to feel that harm they want exact attacks for that and they will try to push you out of those spaces and i don't think that any person of color in online spaces especially women of color hasn't experienced this Um, i experience it sometimes to a greater degree and i would definitely say that darker skinned black women experience it to a much further degree than I do as well. I have some privilege there that actually cushions it and makes some of the things I say more palatable to white people than it would be for someone of darker skin. Um, and it's, but it's interesting to watch the defense where people, you could see that psychology where they're shaking their fist and going, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to make her sorry for making me think about this issue. It, it didn't make me feel good about myself. So how can I make her feel bad about herself? And, you know, they come and they try to say things. And luckily, most of the time, it doesn't bother me too much. Um, I'm sure it does on a level that I just don't have time to acknowledge. Um, but, you know, you have to, to do this work. you got to move on and just keep going. But your Twitter account birthed probably the greatest insult. You, you, I think you said it like five days ago, four or five days ago, and I've probably used it four or five times. Context doesn't even matter, but you called someone the worst, the barge brother. And I thought that is the greatest insult in the world. The guy's last name was the barge, so it fit perfectly. But I feel like if someone says something stupid to you and you call them the worst, the barge brother, it makes complete sense. Like that is that like, like, dude, Chico got out of jail and had a hit album. You're worse than he is. I know. I felt like, you know, it's rare that I get to feel proud of myself, but I felt really proud of myself for that one. You are the worst of our age. And, you know, it's, I, and it works, and I'm really glad to give that to other people to use. I, it was funny. I felt like I was aging myself, right, because I know that there's a huge section of Twitter users who were rapidly Googling the barge and trying to figure out this is. But for everyone who was there, you know, who got it, like, that was my gift to the world. I, I'm, I'm, I am very proud of that one. You don't even know the rhythm of the night. It's so <laughs> fantastic. Um, you mentioned... 
uh, having feeling like you have a certain level of privilege as a light skinned woman, uh, which is absolutely absurd. I get what you're saying, but you're a feminist. You write about social issues. You're a black woman. Like you've got all of the strikes against you. Um, but you mentioned feeling like you have a certain level of privilege because you're a light skinned woman, at least versus a dark skinned black woman. Um, are your kids who are obviously light skinned, are they aware of racism yet? Oh, oh, oh yeah, of course. Uh, very much so. And I, you know, I think for, for my kids who are also light skinned, it's been interesting. My, my younger son is, about the same skin tone as me, um, at times actually a bit darker. And he, you know, I mean, all he had to do, he created a YouTube channel when he was like six where he would talk about Minecraft. Um, and, you know, he was being called the N-word immediately. Mm. Um, he's very aware. And he's afraid. They're all afraid. Kids at a very young age are absorbing what's happening in the world and are terrified, and especially because they, they know they don't have any power. So, you know, I remember at... Um, this last election, my son fell asleep watching, you know, election results. And I looked at his laptop, he fell asleep in his lap, and he was Googling white supremacy. Um, you know, he's a, he was an eight-year-old boy. And that's, you know, it's so sad for me, but it's it's the truth for so many kids. So they're very aware, and they're aware in context. I know my, my teenager, he's almost 17. He's aware of the way he gets treated and the difference of as a light-skinned black kid when he's alone versus when he's hanging out with other black kids. And he's aware of how suddenly he's treated much worse when he's in a group of black kids. Um, and whether that's in school or socially walking down the street and, you know, it really frustrates him and worries him. And he worries for me a lot. Um, you know, he, they're both very concerned with the world. And I would say that starts at a very young age for all of our kids, where they, they are very aware, even before we start talking to them about it, that something's very wrong and that they aren't safe. That's one thing I'm always interested to talk to uh, light-skinned people about, other light-skinned people, because I, I've, all, I've said to people, you experience a different type of racism. Like one thing that I, I – you, you, you're, you're too light for black people but too dark for white people, and – I've, I've always been fascinated by that and how black people will – they'll have your back when it's like you versus white people. But as you just noted, when you're alone with other black people, you're like the butt of the joke. <laughs> yeah, and you know, honestly, for the most part, that doesn't bother me because I recognize that it's part of – is it's kind of the tax on my privilege, right? Some of the animosity, some of the hurt behind that. It's, it's real, right? It's, it's real and based in the fact that I do walk through the world easier. And, and I do so at the expense of darker black people, right? So it's not just because I'm lighter skinned. It's because people can literally point at me and say I'm better than dark skinned black people. And I've had that happen. I've had that happen in work. I've literally had people point to me, you know, while talking to other darker black people and say, why can't you be more like her? And that sort of thing happens all of the time. And I even see it now on social media. I'll be talking, I'll be saying something, and I'll watch someone who just finished insulting a darker-skinned black woman tell me that they can tell I'm more genuine. And I'm saying the exact same thing. And I'm probably saying it a bit harsher. And it's simply because my skin tone makes me seem less threatening. And so when people don't immediately trust, it's because, honestly, there are people who choose to live through the world never examining their privilege and taking advantage of it. And that happens anywhere we see our privilege, whether it's ableism, whether it's race, whether it's skin tone. And when that happens to you a couple of times, when you come across a lot of light-skinned black people who don't want to examine their privilege, just want to benefit from it, who have these, you know, light-skinned hashtags and all of this stuff and don't want to, and want to act like they don't walk through the world any easier, of course, you're going to be distrustful. Of course, you're going to be resentful. And I just take that with a grain of salt. I keep doing my work, and I hope that eventually I can prove to people who are open you know, that I mean to do the work. Um, but otherwise, you know, we keep living. I am very grateful for the fact that when it comes down to battling white supremacy, the black community has always had my back. Mm -hmm. um, I'm incredibly grateful because I think that, you know, it could be easy for people to be more resentful than they are. And so I don't, you know, I've always kind of been, I feel like there's a great amount of responsibility that comes with privilege. And part of it means that you don't, you don't, expect automatic trust. 
You know, there are, there are times I'm sure, especially when I was younger, when I wasn't examining my privilege and I just kept benefiting, especially in corporate situations and things like that, without any question. You know, I can't walk down the street without someone complimenting me on my skin tone. And that just doesn't happen to darker black people, especially darker black women. And there were plenty of times where I just said, oh, thank you. It felt really good about myself for this thing that I, I didn't earn, you know, yeah. <laughs> that meant nothing, and, and never examined what that meant. And so, you know, I try to make sure that my sons know this as well, right, that they understand that, yes, you do, you know, that even this pain that you may feel, this disenfranchisement where you feel like you don't quite fit anywhere, that's also a product of white supremacy. I and just, that it's our job with that, you know, to fight it as well. And, you know, the only way to get free is when we all get free and we just got to keep fighting for it. I just clapped back with Obama was light skinned and keep it moving. So yeah. were the <laughs> so were the DeBarge brothers, as a matter of fact, the DeBarge brothers. Very, very, you know what I mean? you very know, we have a lot. We have a lot of penance. <laughs> Christopher Williams. There's, there's a there's a couple out there if you're willing to. Mm-hmm. If you're willing to work. Uh, OK, since we're since we're on the topic of R&B, I got you. You referenced him as an unnamed uh, R&B artist in your book, uh, but you've made it very clear on Twitter who you're talking about. And 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 this was one of the things that I was most looking forward to talking to you about is I feel like black people have a, and, and to a degree I understand, but to a degree I don't. I feel like black people have the need to defend black men no matter what. R. Kelly is a fantastic example. Uh, Bill Cosby is another one. Um, Russell Simmons uh, comes to mind. And again, to a degree, I understand. But really, do we have to acknowledge these men as, well, they're strong. They're strong. black. we can't tear down our black men because of, you know, white supremacy or because of dot, dot, dot. It doesn't feel right to back black men at all cost. Oh, yeah. No, it's completely wrong. And it's, you know, the massage war in that um, it's palpable and it's harming black women. If you love black people, you got to love black women. And that means you got to defend them when they're being harmed. And we have these abusers of black women where we go, oh, we, you know, we, it's important that we don't bash black men. What about black women? <laughs> what about black We exist? You know, and we're, you know, what are 10 of us not worth one Bill Cosby, you know, are 20 of us not worth one Bill Cosby? Um, we are worth more than that. I think it's also really important for us to acknowledge, you know, I mean, that's that's built not only in, you know, the defenses, of course, that we build against racism. And I get it, right? I get the fear that one bad black man is going to harm many other black men. And that's because society loves to take one example and run with it and and soak fear with it. And you hear that, you know, and I definitely, people tweet examples of, you know, you know, people, you know, even Al Sharpton, people will constantly, oh, just like Al Sharpton. You know, if someone doesn't like Al Sharpton, suddenly he becomes the example for all black men who have something to say about race, right? That's white supremacy's business. And we can battle that as it happens for what it is. But I think that we also have a duty, if we love ourselves, to expect more of black men. And to hold ourselves accountable for our abuses and to say, no, we aren't going to con- continue this pattern of abuse that was set in place by white supremacy, this abuse of black women. And we're not going to make it OK that we know that black men can be more than this. We know they are more than this. And therefore, we will hold black men who abuse people, who are violent, who are harming black women. We will hold them accountable for what they do and know that because they are a black man, they can do better and should be doing better. And because they chose not to, they will be responsible for their actions. And because we love black women, we will defend and protect black women. And I think that it's really important that we look at that and that we think about, you know, if we say that we're doing this, that we're defending these really abusive, unrepentantly abusive black men because we care about black men. Is that really what we're saying? Or are we saying that we think that they can't do better, that we think? What sort of example do we want to set for our young black men that we're raising? I want to set one of accountability. I want my sons to know that if they ever, ever took liberties with women, that they would be held accountable like that. I want them to know that I expect more. And that they will be held responsible for failing to live up to those basics that I know they can live. 
And I think that we, when we define what we love about blackness and who we are, we also have to define our ideals. And we have to hold people accountable for the ways in which they harm other people, especially other people in our community. And so I don't think that you can say you love black men when you try to make it okay for black men to continue to be abusive. That's not what love looks like. That's not what love looks like for me as a parent. It's not what love looks like for me as a black person. And I think that we really need to look at what we're saying and the harm we're actually doing in our community and what we're saying about black women and their value in society and their possible contributions to society when we decide that one abusive black man is worth more than 10 young black women. It's just not... It doesn't work. You can't say you love black people and do that. And which is why I'm amazed at how we pick and choose who we defend sometimes, because we've all openly mocked, like, say, Ben Carson. We open. But the fact is, Ben Carson is a black man and he's made some questionable decisions. But I don't think there's any history of him being an abuser. But we openly mock him and make fun of him while we're trying to defend people like R. Kelly. Yeah, and I think that we need to look at, the truth is, is that part of it, I think, is honestly just how little as a society we value black women. Um, You know, we really, it doesn't matter when it's black women that are being harmed. We can view Ben Carson as a threat because he seems to be, you know, harming with his politics this great swath of black people. And because he doesn't seem to want to be appealing to the black community. But when we say that a couple of hit singles is worth more than the life and dignity of black women, Mm -hmm. we're really saying what we think about black women. And I think that, you know, if there's one thing where we can spend a lot of internal time talking with each other, doing some real work, it's in recognizing that black women have value, that black women have been holding things down since the beginning and recognizing how much misogyny that we have, absorbed over the centuries and how much it is harming the black women that are really carrying us and that we need to make some real change because we cannot survive without black women. And when we say that, no, you know, this person, we're going to toss out Ben Carson because his politics are trash and they are harming black people. And they are. And I've taught, I have no love for Ben Carson, but then say that that, you know, matters. But then someone who right now has, you know, young black women held basically against their will at his house is fine because we liked a couple of jams that he came out with mm, years ago. Right. Um, we're basically saying we don't care about black women, that we only care when it starts to affect black men, that we only care when it becomes no longer entertaining for us, no longer useful for us. And we just need to we need to value black women more. Yeah, we don't want to take Honey Love off the playlist yet. Um, (laughs) is being a feminist harder than fighting for social equality, social, social justice? No, no, it's not. I mean, it depends. I'm a, you know, I've been a feminist my whole life. Um, and I would definitely say that it comes up, you know, um, I can talk about race and get plenty of people riding along the moment I bring feminism in, of course, I'll have, you know, there'll be like a hotep at my door trying to tell me, you know, that I'm a bad wench or something like that. But the truth is, is that race is the thing that magnifies everything else. It, it magnifies the sexism I face. Um, it, you know, I, when I walk down the street, I know that it's, it's usually actually my race that's impacting my safety more than anything else. And I find it in every corner. So I can be doing feminist work and race pops up nine times out of ten. You know, when I'm talking about class issues, race is going to pop up. When I'm, you know, office meeting, race is going to pop up. And it will be seen more than anything. And at times, race even erases my gender. My gender often doesn't even exist to many white people I encounter. What they see is black. And so I would definitely say that race is harder. And if you were to look through my um, hate mail, there's a mix of both, right? They'll throw in gender as well. But it's, it's mostly people who are very, very threatened by what I'm saying about race um if i you know and i know feminists who have it really hard my sister-in-law is one who's definitely people dedicate their lives to trying to make her life hard because she talks about issues of feminism but i also know that her general safety walking down the street if she were a black woman talking about these things uh would be much more compromised and so i would definitely say that that race is a stronger one um 
but it, no matter what, it's not easy. Um, and, you know, I can pick and choose. And some days I don't know why someone's yelling at me. <laughs> I don't know which one it is, if it's a mix of both. Um, there is no safe corner for me. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. unless I'm in a room with intersectional black women, like that small room, that's the only place where I can sit and breathe and relax. Otherwise, you know, if I'm in anti-racist spaces, there's going to be some sexism popping up left and right, trying to minimize me and make me unsafe. If I'm in feminist spaces, there's definitely going to be a ton of racism popping up and making me feel unsafe and marginalizing what I have to say. Um, and there's very little rest unless you want to, unless you can find those small bits of community. And, and I do, I try to make space where, you know, I can sit with other women of color and take a breath occasionally. where <laughs> We know that nothing's going to pop up out of left field to make, to let us know that we are considered less than, but it's everywhere. I'll say there, I knew there was a correlation. I feel like there's been a correlation between the Me Too movement and the Black Lives Matter movement. And it, you know, it was interesting to say some hear you say some some days I don't even know why I'm being yelling yelled at. But the fact is, you know, that those two movements threaten to a certain degree white men, and when they're threatened, they mock it, which is what Donald Trump did a few weeks ago. He mocked the Me Too movement. And I, I, it, it feels to me like this is all just based out of fear. Oh, definitely. It's fear and it's, it's defensiveness of power. And, and I think that it's really important for people to understand that there is not a ton of rationality behind this defensiveness. Because what people are defending, it's not only financial and political power, which there is a lot for some. But for some white men, there's very little. It's about ego and identity. Right. Seeing yourself as at the top of the food chain, seeing yourself as superior, seeing yourself as someone who is good and right and more qualified. That's all built into it. And anything that threatens that, whether it be women, whether it be people of color, whether it be disabled people, you're going to react violently against because it's your identity. And there isn't a lot of rational argument you can have to counter that. What you have to do is actually just keep working on dismantling the system. There are some people who who there are some white men who are fundamentally against these things and don't realize where they're being defensive, don't realize where they're holding it up. And, you know, those are people you can talk with and try to get them to see differently and act differently. But what we're seeing right now is really a defensive identity of people who say, I don't want to examine the way I act on dates. I don't want to examine the way I act in the office. I don't want to compete head to head with a qualified person of color for this job. I want these things because I was told from the day I was born that they were mine. And that's not rational. And so you don't necessarily, you can't give words to that. And so then what you do is you attack, you undermine, you mock, you make it into a joke because you really can't come and engage it with any sort of integrity because what's holding it up isn't something that's really logical or true. And so I think like what we're seeing right now is a ton of fear, but it's fear of losing position and losing identity. And it's a valid fear because the thing about Black Lives Matter, the thing about Me Too, the, what's really at risk, we're not seeing men's lives destroyed. We're not, no matter how much they say they are. We're not seeing white men actually being destroyed. What we are seeing is the reputation, the idea of white men being changed. And that's the biggest threat. These movements, that that's why people call it identity politics. What scares them is that their identity is at risk by the emergence of other identities as valid and true, and by the emergence of truth of how that identity actually functions in society. And so, you know, they're afraid because it is actually real damage. Saying Black Lives Matter is harmful to them because it challenges the thought that they could net, that they would go through life without actually having to think of how they are harming people of color, and in particularly Black people. And that challenges their identity and their sense of self. And that's really where the harm is, because we're not seeing a huge ton of legislative change, right? It's not that. It's I never had to think about this before, and that was part of who I was, was someone who could never, who never had to investigate and thought of myself as a good person, never challenged how I thought what I got, never had to think about the benefits I have at the expense of others. And now you have these movements that are specifically calling that out. And I don't like that. That's all I have in a capitalist society, you know, and I think we forget that honestly what the bargain of white supremacy for many white men 
all they ended up getting out of the deal at the end for a lot of them was identity. They didn't get a lot of money. <laughs> they didn't get job security. They got identity. And that's what we've been coming for by showing how white supremacy actually functions. And that's where the real threat is. You talked about legit. I feel like we could talk for another hour. You've been so generous with your time. I want to make sure I point out you just talked about legislation. You also talk about in your book, the school to prison pipeline, which I think is really important for people to learn about. The book is called So You Want to Talk About Race. Uh, And I also want to point out you've used the term white supremacy a lot here in this conversation. And you have a fantastic article that's available online. You do not believe there is a middle ground between white supremacy and social justice. Yes, certainly. I, I mean, just imagine having a conversation and saying, you know what, we're going to be okay with a little racism. <laughs> we're going to be okay with a right. little oppression. What's the level that you're comfortable with? Uh, no, there's no middle ground. You, you go after all of it. It's like, it's like a negotiation. I'm going to write a number down. You tell me, <laughs> you tell me when you're comfortable with this. For goodness sakes. Ajoma, you are the absolute best. The book is so good. You're, I, I, I cannot wait for whatever you do next, even if it's just a tweet, uh, because I, I enjoy everything you do. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time today. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. So you want to talk about race. That's the name of her book. She is absolutely fantastic. Again, a ton of work available for free online. I, I can't recommend you checking her out enough. There are so many things, you know, when I listen to a book, I... I have my uh, notes open on my iPhone or I have the computer in my lap and I'm jotting down topics. There's so many things. You know, I'd mentioned the the school to prison pipeline. She talked about that uh, in depth in the book. And that was meant to be a main focal point of what we were going to talk about today. But the conversation just uh, kept taking us elsewhere. She talked about the the use of the term. Uh, cracker. There was a, another a, another great line in the book is uh, I could call a white person a cracker and ruin their day. But if a white person calls me the N word, I could end up dead. And she lays all of that out again. She talked about cultural appropriation. That was something I wanted to ask her about. I've started to lose track of what music it's OK for me to and uh, to listen to and what music is not OK for me to listen to. Um But again, all things that she discusses in her book, So You Want to Talk About Race, it is a fantastic read. Uh, If you have any thoughts on today's show, I'd love to hear them. Uh, There's a number of ways you can reach out to me as we laid out here uh, at the start of the show, and we'll always lay out here for you. Uh, Damian Barling on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can find me there. If you want to follow Ajoma Alua on Twitter, you absolutely should. Uh, It's I J E O M A O L U O. Worth the follow. Uh, she's a great writer. She's a great tweeter, and as you've heard, she's a she's a great interview uh, as well. Uh, again, thank you so much for being here with us. If, it, if it's your first time, head back into the archives. Check out all the old episodes we have. Uh, hit the subscribe button on whatever podcast platform you're on. Uh, never miss a single episode. We drop them every single Thursday. Uh, we want to make sure you're caught up on everything we're doing here. Again, thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of today's show. What is the compromise between justice and oppression? What gray area between inequality and equality exists? There is none. You cannot have a little injustice and call it justice. You cannot have a little inequality and call it equality. Whenever you decide that you have the power to slow or stop justice and equality for others, you are immediately ensuring the continuation of injustice and inequality by placing yourself above those seeking justice and equality. That's from our guest today, Ajoma Alua, in her essay, There Is No Middle Ground Between Racism and Justice. I'm Damian Barling. We'll see you next week. Thank you.